Glory. Thank you, Carol. That's a, a good song. When you think about all the times you wish the Lord, you wanted him to do something for you, or you're not thankful, or your things not going the way you think they ought to go. Folks, to be honest, if the only thing he did for us is die on the cross for our sins, that should be enough. And we should be thankful for the rest of our life, no matter what the circumstances are. I hope you have that same opinion. Well, thank you for those songs. Uh, they were wonderful. I, um, his mercy is more. A good pastor friend of mine, Charles Boswell, his son, Matthew, wrote that song. And um, his mercy is more. Another song that I like to hear, I think it was the Newsboys that uh, put it together. I don't know if you remember the song, We Believe. Uh, I like that one. We believe in God the Father. I believe in God the Father. Uh, I believe in God, and I'm not Him. There's a lot of people in this world that think they are Him. And uh, I believe He's the Creator. I believe He created male and female. And um, what's happening today in our transgenderism, and it's interesting to me uh, that they're calling that sexuality is fluid, but yet a man who wants to be a woman, there must be a definition of what a woman is if he wants to be a woman. And if a woman wants to be a man, there must be a definition of a man if he wants to be, or she wants to be a man. So really, there's no necess necessity to be changing genders because they've already affirmed there's two genders. God created us. And he's in charge, and he's created this universe, and he's created this earth, and we're to be good stewards of it. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the crucifixion. I believe that he conquered death. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in the church is the bride of Christ. And that the church is not a fortress, it's not a stadium, it's not a border crossing, it's a body of believers organized to bring the message of Christ to the world, to be the salt and light, to be the social conscience of our culture, uh, to restore the breach. It's made up of watchmen who are warning, and uh, warning of the main and last thing that that song says. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the crucifixion. I believe in the resurrection. And I believe he's coming again. I believe he's coming again. Folks, I want to share that with you. Um, I don't know what Pastor Rick might be teaching you about the last days and the end days. There's many interpretations about it. Uh, I believe that the Lord is going to come. I believe that there is a period of tribulation that the, God is going to judge the nations. And he's going to bring Israel back to the fold and bring Israel back to belief through that period of tribulation. And it's a set time of seven years. And after that, I believe he's going to bring in the new millennium. And after that, he's going to bring in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, I realize that in my age, sometimes I think about the end a lot. And sometimes it's difficult to talk to people about the last days, especially if they're young, because they, they want, to, want to do a whole bunch. But I tell young people, whatever you miss, if the Lord Jesus Christ comes today, whatever you miss doing, he's going to make up for it when you get into the new heaven and the new earth. And I want to tell you something. A million years from now as a Christian, when I'm in the new heaven and the new earth, I won't be sitting back and saying, you know, I didn't get to do such and such when I was on this earth. I miss not doing such and such. No, that's not the case. But dear friends, I want you to know as a believer, and especially I think all of you would also agree to me that this world, especially this country, has gone completely mad. And they're out of control. And it's hard to talk to people about this out of control. But I want you to know that we're more smarter. We're more wise than the CIA. We're more smarter than the Homeland Security, the FBI, because we know what's going on. Because you see, this Bible has told us everything that's happening today, it's already told us it would be happening. And it's also told us what's going to happen in the end. It's going to help us what happens in the conclusion. And folks, there is an end. There's an end to all things. 
Um, I think about I was battling when, when I was battling to retire from the active pastorate. Um, you know, I had a hard time. I know all you folks have been retired, but you, when you get retired, you, you just get a little shaky about retiring. You know, Tony and I were talking about retiring. And, um, you know, I don't want to retire. You know, I can't end the thing. And my family finally said to me, uh, everything has an end. <laughs> you know, everything's got to have an end. And uh, my active pastor had to have an end. And now I, I have a new season. And uh, I believe the Lord's called me to, now that I'm out of the pulpit, to be more in the community and to be a salt and light. And uh, so I went and got on the town council, the great city of Pamphlin. And um, I tell them it's the smallest city in all the America. And um, then they made me vice mayor. So maybe I'll make mayor one day and, and go on to be governor of Virginia. <laughs> Whatever the case may be. But these are our last days. I want you to turn very quickly into the, the epistle of 1 Peter. I want to read you two chapters, one to 1 Peter, and get ready to turn over to 2 Peter. But 1 and 2 Peter is talking to people that Peter has been involved and has nurtured and discipled, and they're going through tremendous struggles, tremendous persecution. So it is a wonderful epistle for you to be talking about what we're going through in 2023 and what will look like we're going to be going in 2024. And um, there are things going on. I've been around a long time, and I want you to know the things sure are a lot different than when I was growing up. And um, I know that Matthew 24 gives you a, a wonderful description. The Lord gives you a wonderful description about all the things that's going to be happening in the last days. I realize that there's great discussion to say, well, preacher, you know, those lawlessness and crime and perversion and um, um, government foolishness and, and man's evilness has been going on forever. I want you to know something. There's things going on today. I believe that there are six basic or six or eight basic signs that really show that it's a lot different in the wickedness of today than it has been for all the centuries before. And a couple of things. Let me just share that. I, I got a couple of bullet points on that. First of all, um, uh, the technology of our day. You know, when Revelation talks about those two witnesses and that the whole world will be able to see him, those two witnesses die and then rise, we have the modern technology today that the whole world can see everything around at any one time. You never had that before. Never had that before. And then you have the total control of an elite group of people. Revelation talks about the Antichrist. It talks about the, the beast and, the, and the, the horn that comes out. And, and you've got a group of people. You've got a group of people and you've got a one world system that is together. This pandemic that recently went through, which was, I believe, a plandemic. <laughs> but anyway, uh, really show the whole world was, was involved in that. The whole world were working together with that. That's the first time, in a sense, that the global system was controlled by a few and, and doing and trying to take control of the world. And you have people that are slowly believing that they need to have total control of your life and my life. And that's what a revelation is. About. That's what the Antichrist is all about. Um, and um, how many of you ever heard, don't raise your hand, because one of the things that I'm concerned about, and I believe what's happening today should make us involved in prophecy and reading prophecy. You know, the Bible, one third of the Bible is prophecy. And all the things that the Lord has predicted. And he said, listen, I've told you these things. I've told you these things. So when they happen, you know that what I've said is true. All the promises, thousands of promises. Do you know there's over 7,000 promises in this Bible? How many do you know? There's prophecies about everything that's going to happen in the last days. You need to be watchmen so that you know what's going on so that you can be ready. But I've asked a group of people, and I won't ask you to raise your hand. I was talking to a men's fellowship uh, not too long ago, and I asked them, I said, how many of you ever heard of the World Economic Forum? Only one hand went up. Only one hand went up. Now, I don't know how many of you all have heard of the World Economic Forum, but that's a club of the elite of this world who meet on a regular basis, and they have an eschatological vision of utopia for the world. 
And part of that is controlling the climate, controlling the environment, uh, controlling what you eat and, and um, how many people we should have. Folks, I want you to know that, you know, we have people who believe they're going to live forever and they're going to make a utopia here. And a lot of what's happening in the transgenderism has to do with, and you can look up on your webpage, look in the computer, the World Economic Forum, and you'll have the exact, all the points that they want to achieve in this world. And a lot of things, what they're saying goes right along with the book of Revelation. And uh, one of the things, and, and I kind of, just my personal opinion, all this transgenderism is just a little bit of experimenting because, um, as you know, artificial intelligence is a big thing today. And uh, that's another little twist. Remember, the Antichrist will be wounded or injured somehow, and he will rise from his injury, rise from the dead, so to speak. And uh, they'll have the ability with artificial intelligence to make something look absolutely real, a human being. Uh, I saw a, I saw a, um, um, anchor, a news anchor lady on the, on the news um, in India. And she was a nice young lady, dressed very nice, very attractive young lady. And uh, afterwards, and you can find this on YouTube, she was an artificial intelligence. She wasn't a real human being. And she was giving the news. They're a national news for the country of India. And so artificial intelligence, they believe that they can live forever and uh, in a sense be their own gods. Because you see, once you believe that you can change people to be something that they're not, once you can decide who can, who can live and who can die and abortion and all those type of things, and then if you believe that you can live forever, that's a pretty good definition of a god, isn't it? And they think they're gods. And um, they believe that they can take their brain somehow, and uh, they're going to be, um, as, as China is doing, getting all kinds of harvesting organs from, from the human beings they don't want around. But they're going to be able to take your brain, hook it to a computer, and connect it to the cloud out there, and you can live forever. And they're working on that. And uh, these are some of the signs. It's just, as you're watching it, it makes you say, the Lord's coming soon. Amen. Because I believe the government's too big. I believe corruption's too big. We cannot turn the thing around. We always pray for revival. And we always pray for turning around. But I believe the time has come that the only hope that we have is when Jesus Christ comes again and sets foot on the Mount of Olives. Now, folks, I want to be ready for that. I want to be ready for that. Now, if you're not saved, you need to get saved. That's one way to get ready. But I want you to know there's another thing. As a Christian, when I stand in the presence of the Lord, I don't want to be muddied up with filth. I want to make sure my sanctification is up in order. And so Peter talks about that a little bit. And so he says here in 1 Peter chapter 4, let me just read that chapter here. And then I just want to give you about three points to leave with you about being ready for the Lord's coming. Being ready for the Lord's coming. However you feel how he's going to come, he's going to come. <laughs> Therefore, since Christ suffered, 1 Peter chapter 4, for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness and lust and drunkenness, reveries, drunken parties and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But here it is. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. So number one point I'll leave with you. If the end is soon, let's get serious about it. Let's get serious. Let's be watching. Let's see what's going on so we know what's going on. Be watchful in our prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. 
for love covers a multitude of sins. Now, I think it's interesting here in verse 9 of getting ourselves ready. We need to be serious and be studying the scriptures, be studying about prophecy, be up on prophecy, and um, be, be in prayer. That's our greatest weapon of dealing with change and, and dealing with what's happening in our world today is prayer. And we should be prayer warriors and praying about this government and restraining this government and restraining evil. And above all things, we are to be together, loving one another and being a family. And I like this word, be hospitable, be hospitable. Folks, I, I want to get a book. I, I forget the lady's name. She was a, um, a lesbian and she taught uh, uh, queer theology or something up there in Columbia University and she got saved. And she's written a book that I've got to get because it says the gospel comes with a house key. The gospel comes with a house key. I believe the greatest thing we can do is really be a family and care for one another and be together with one another and eat together and visit one another and, and be ready to take care of each other. Because when the hard times come, we need to be like uh, the Old Testament and have a prophet's quarters ready for those who may lose their job because they stand for the Lord. Be hospitable, it says. And each one of you receive a gift and minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Serve. You serve the Lord. You have a ministry. Every one of you is supposed to have a ministry. We're talking to pick about chores. I never know what pick's going to say. But talking about chores, you know, every one of us, we're in a family. You know, when you're in a family, you have chores. When I was a little fellow, I had a chore. You know what my chore was? Every Saturday, I had to vacuum the house. And my, my sisters had to wash the clothes and iron. Now, I want you to know, you didn't get paid for those chores. <laughs> You did those chores because you were part of the family. Folks, every one of you have a ministry. And I should be able to sit next to you in the pew and say, what's your ministry here at Concord Baptist Church? Everyone is supposed to be serving. And so when the Lord comes, I want him to see you serving. Serving. Minister to one another according to your gifts. And... Um, and then he goes on, if anyone speaks, speaks with the word of God, beloved, verse 13, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you are partake of Christ's sufferings. When we go through our sufferings, when we go through our difficult times, we are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemy, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. Folks, not only will you be serious about the Lord's coming and be ready for him and not think it's going to be a far off. I realize that Peter was saying this 2,000 years ago. Well, if it was 2,000 years ago, it definitely should be near now. <laughs> but we're supposed to be living as though he could come at any time. He says he's going to come as a thief. He's going to come when you least expect it type of a thing. And um, so we are always to live as Christians as though the Lord could come tomorrow. And I want to tell you, 1 John says, believing in the coming of the Lord purifies us. Now, how does it purify us for believing and believing in the imminency that the Lord could come at any time? Because, friends, when I think about something that I want to do that I know I shouldn't do, when I get in a sinful habit, you know, all I've got to think to myself, what would happen if Jesus were to come at this moment? And man, how I would be ashamed if he were to come right now. 
in what I'm doing, and I know I shouldn't be doing. Now, the Lord calls us to be blameless, but we'll never be sinless, dear friends. But we can be blameless for confessing our sins and dealing with them, maturing out of them, and, and uh, overcoming them. In fact, the Lord has told us that he'll give us a crown for every temptation we overcome. And so that's part of our sin. So, but, but we are to stand. And uh, when we stand, we're going to offend people. Well, well, preacher, you know, I don't want to talk to people about prophecy. I don't want to talk about the Lord's coming because, you know, it kind of scares people off. And I don't want anybody to leave the church because they're all scared. Folks, I want you to know prophecy wasn't given to you to scare you. Prophecy was given to you to tell you what's going to happen. And so you be ready. And also prophecy has been given to you so that you'll have hope. Because we know what's going to happen for us. And I believe with all my heart that the Lord's the tribulation is not for us. I believe in the thing called the rapture. And the Lord will take us out of here. It's not for the church. It's for the nation of Israel and the judgment of the nations. And, um, and, and nothing has to happen in a sign before he comes. But I want you to just give you a few quick points. When you make a stand, you need to make a stand. Do not affirm the lies of the devil. Because another sign of the last days is the demonic doctrine that is being taught. Folks, it's absolutely mad that we have a school system that their greatest agenda is to tell people who are um, little children that they can be what they're an opposite. Absolutely amazing. That is a demonic doctrine. Folks, it's a mental spiritual problem when somebody wants to be an opposite. You know, when you, when you have a person who has anorexia, we don't go to them and say, if they don't come to you and say, listen, I believe I'm overweight. Oh, okay, so, what? and they're not, you know, they're skinny, they've been in anorexia. We don't give them a, all right, we need to send you to the hospital and give you a liposuction. No, we try to persuade them that they're not overweight. And so when somebody comes and says, I want to be something else that I'm not, we need to talk to them. It's a mental issue and it's a spiritual issue. You don't send them to the hospital and mutilate them to try to make them something that they're not. In fact, it's impossible for what they do. But when you stand, folks, you know, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to cause any conflict. Folks, offense, preaching the gospel and not, try, and not offending somebody is an oxymoron. Because when you tell people who rejected God that there's a God and you will be accountable to him, you're going to offend them. But when you stand for truth, always be ready. Be ready to stand for truth. Take every opportunity to share about the Lord. And, um, and pray to do that. I always remember my wife Kathy prayed one time that, Oh, Lord, help me to be a, be a witness to somebody. And she got on an elevator. She worked for the American Bankers Association way back in our early days of marriage. And she got on the elevator, and there was a... a, a a young lady reading the book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Remember that book? Hal Lindsey, Late Great Planet Earth. And so when they got off the elevator, Kathy tracked that girl down and said, hey, I saw you reading The Late Great Planet Earth. Here's an opportunity. God opened the door. God's always going to open the door for you to share the truth, but you got to be ready. And she said, yeah, and you know, if this is true, I'm going to hell. And Kathy says, well, I can tell you how to change that. She led her to the Lord. She quit her job the next week and went back home. I forget where it was, out in the West somewhere, because she was having an affair with one of the bosses there in the American Bankers Association. Repented and, and changed. I want you to be ready. I want you to be ready. And then when you talk, be reasonable. Be reasonable. Give an orderly presentation of the truth and the gospel. Do you, do you know how to tell the gospel? There was a, uh, uh, I, Joel, I know he, he, got, he got involved in sin and ruined his testimony, but he repented. And he, but there was an evangelist way back in New Orleans, Louisiana, called Bob Harrington. And uh, he was called the chaplain of Bourbon Street. And I always loved listening to him preach. And I remember, too, when he first gave his testimony, he says he was an insurance salesman. And he would go to churches 
and uh, he would sit on the back pew and get to know people and so create a network that he could talk to him about business. Well, there was a revival one time and, and the preacher was preaching and says, somebody in here needs Jesus Christ. Somebody in here is going to hell. And every time Bob Harrington says, every time he pointed his finger, he pointed right at me. And he said, the Holy Spirit is working in somebody's life here. And Bob Harrington, man, he started to grab the top of that pew. He th man, he was just, oh, the Spirit was convicting him all over. But he thought, he said, but he had, um, uh, I don't know, he had um, um, some guy next to him. I forget his name. We'll call him Harold. I, I had Harold sitting right next to me. And I thought maybe the Holy Spirit was working on him and it was overflowing on me. <laughs> And so I, I, I stepped, and so when, the, when, the, when they had the altar call, I stepped out of the pew to let Harold by. And when Harold didn't move, I moved, and I ran down, and I grabbed that preacher by the throat. I hugged him, and I started to give him money because I thought he was, I just felt so tremendous that I didn't know what to do. And he got saved. Bob Harrington got saved that day. He didn't really know what was happening, but he got in the car and he was speeding like mad going down the, down the highway and a state trooper stopped him and said, sir, where are you going? He says, I'm sorry, officer, but I, I just, I'm going home. I just got saved and my life has changed. Bob Harrington said that state trooper walked around, got in the seat next to him and he says, tell me about it. He says, well, I don't know. But this is what you need to do. You need to go down to that church down at the end of the road. <laughs> you need to sit on the back pew <laughs> and sit next to Harold, <laughs> and you'll get it. Now, that wasn't a reasonable presentation of the gospel. But you need to be ready to give a reasonable presentation of the gospel. That's, you know, and all this stuff about losing our rights, folks. Freedom of speech, that's what freedom of speech is all about. Let us share our message. You share your message and we'll try to persuade each other. And whoever wins the argument, we can maybe put it into law and get enough people to vote on it. But when you tell me I can't share my opinion and only can believe what you believe, then you know what that makes me think? What you believe, you really don't believe. And you can't prove it. So, and be respectful when you talk to people. We can win an argument and lose a soul. Be respectful. And God will vindicate you. God will vindicate you. The eyes of the Lord are looking for those who are standing up for him. Well, that's 1 Peter 4. Be serious about the coming of the Lord and getting yourself ready. Stand for truth, even though you'll suffer for it. They'll lie about you. They'll slander you, and they might even do it. You may even have to do it and stand for the truth in the, in the church. My greatest opposition has been people in the church. And um, many times. Um, but God will vindicate you. And then last, let me just read this last portion in 2 Peter. Go over there, 2 Peter chapter 3. Time's getting away from us. 2 Peter chapter 3. And this is one that I... I've really focused on. Beloved, I write to you this second epistle, in both of which I want to stir up your pure minds by way of a reminder. That's what the pastor, Pastor Rick, does every Sunday. He wants to remind you. Most of you, as I look out upon you all today, I think most of you have been Christians for a while. But we need to be stirred up and reminded, because we're forgetful people. So Peter says, I want to remind you, I want to stir you up, I want to remind you that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And all that you're going through and all the struggles and all the madness of this world, I want you to know the prophets told you about it. And at the commandment of us as the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Things have not always been the same. But the heavens of the earth 
and the earth which now exist are kept in store by the same word reserved for fire until the day of judgment and partition of ungodly men. Folks, do you realize everything that you have, everything that you own? That house that you just got paid for, that house that you got a mortgage on, that beautiful car that you're driving, all your clothes, everything. I want you to know it's all going to be burned up one day. And if you're living for those things, you're a fool. It's all going to be burned up. It's all going to be burned up. The only thing that lasts forever is your soul and each other's people. It's the only thing. You can either spend your life on things that's all going to be burned up, all going to be burned up, or you can invest it in knowing the Lord and building treasures in heaven that will last forever and investing it in people and each other. Each other. And when I go to heaven, I want all the people that I invested in. You know, when the devil gets me down, when the devil tells me I'm no good, when the devil tells me I'm washed up, when the devil tells me I'm not making any impact, all I got to do is just kind of look in my notebook of marriages and, and funerals and write down all the people. All the people that I've invested in lives that are serving the Lord today. And that I've had a part in leading them to Jesus. Investing or spending your life. That's, that's another sermon. I can do a sermon on that. And then, very, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a, is a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering toward us. Folks, my prayer, and you know, as you pray for our health and all those type of things, do you know the main prayer that, that John prayed during their Wednesday night Bible study prayer time? He said, Dear Lord, come quickly. You pray that? Come quickly. Sometimes we don't pray because we're not ready for him to come. But you know why he waits? I'll tell you why he waits. Because there's some loved ones I know that need Jesus Christ as their Savior. And every day he waits, another one comes into the kingdom. So I'm thankful that he's waited. He's long-suffering. And I'm so thankful he was long-suffering for me. And remember that when you have to wait for something that you've been praying for, he waits for you. So you wait for him. And so, beloved, he's not slack concerning his promise, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, here it is, folks. This is the main message of today. What manner of people ought you to be? And what does it say? Holy. Holy. Holy and godly. What manner of persons in holy conduct and godliness? Looking. For the hastening and the coming of the day of the God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Folks, that's my last point. I want you to be serious about the coming of the Lord. I want you to stand for truth. And I want you to be sanctified. You know what sanctification is? Sanctification is dealing with your heart, dealing with your mind. Is getting rid of all getting rid of all the filth in your life, getting rid of all those habits, um, not living for material things. It's getting rid of those words, those actions. It's doing away with the deeds of darkness. It's following Jesus and obeying Him without blame. Can't live sinless, but we can be blameless. It's living a spirit-filled life. That's a whole new sermon. 
you putting on the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, you put that on. You put that on every day. And you put on the armor of God not to go to bed, but to go into battle. In the Word of God, knowing the Word of God. And folks, another, another point of why I believe these is, is the last days is because the one word that Jesus Christ kept repeating over and over and over again in Matthew 24. In the latter days, there will be great deception. How many of you all believe anything the government tells you? How many of you know what they're teaching in our schools? It's deception. Deception. Do you know what they're preaching in, in sermons? Praise the Lord that this pulpit is not deceiving you. Because I know Rick. I know Pastor Rick. He teaches from the truth. But that's not everywhere. That's not everywhere. There's great deception in the church in general. Put on the armor. You got to be in the word to understand. You got to be in the word to understand. And then I like when he closes out. I'm back in 1 Peter. Therefore, since all these things ought to be dissolved, what manner of people should we be? Holy conduct and God, looking for and hastening. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Deal with your sin, folks. Confess it. You ought to have an accountability brother, accountability sister that you can share when you're dealing with things that you need to get rid of in your life. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. And also our beloved Paul wrote about these things in his epistles. Therefore, beloved, since you know these things beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your steadfastness, being led away with error and the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. And then it says, um, um, I was looking for I can't find a rule now, but it's in Second Peter. You find it after I close. The Lord, Peter says, now listen, if you're standing for truth, you're serious about the coming of the Lord, and you're sanctified, and you're working on your sanctification, you will have hope and joy and peace and calmness. I think the greatest witness you can have is when the world has gone mad, you're calm and you're joyful. And Peter said, be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. Now, folks, has anybody come up to you lately and asked you why you have so much hope? I told Paul, I said, one of the things I like about Concord Baptist when I came and visited with you and I'm going to continue to visit with you is that you all seem joyful. You're talking to one another and carry it on and got to quiet you down before they can open the service. I think of the great preacher E.V. Hill talks about a young preacher that he uh, pastor in a church that built a, a new building. And the young pastor would always sit on the front pew. And, the, and the, the church bought this new building, made this wonderful worship service choir loft, and had all these nice chairs, expensive chairs for the preacher to sit on. And the old young preacher just wouldn't come up and sit on it. The deacons came up to him and said, now, listen, preacher, you know, we, we, we got those chairs up there for you. And we spent a lot of money to have those, those chairs for you to sit in. And um, we, we like you to sit on it. He said, no, I, I just want to sit on the front pew. And then I'll, I'll come on up and preach. Well, then the ladies came to him. And when the ladies come to you, watch out. So the ladies came up to him and said, now, preacher, we, we, we've spent a lot of money on those chairs up there. Why don't you come up and sit on those chairs? You know, we, we ought to get rid of you if you're not going to sit on those chairs. Well, we at least have the right to know why you won't go up there and sit on those chairs. And he says, well, if I tell you why, you won't get rid of me, will you? No, we won't get rid of you. Okay, well, I want to tell you something. If I got up there and sat on that platform and sat on those chairs and looked out upon you for 30 minutes before I preached. I wouldn't feel like preaching much. Do you have hope? Do you have joy? 
Now, joy is different from happiness. That doesn't mean you walk around with a smile on your face all the time, but there's a peace about you. There's a joy about you. See, joy comes down from the deep inside because you know you trust in the Lord that all things are going to work out for good and that he's going to take care of you and he's going to bring you through it. And you're going to trust him no matter what, no matter what the circumstances are. You see, happiness depends upon happenings. And if your happenings don't happen the way you want your happenings to happen, you don't have happiness. Did you get that? But joy doesn't depend upon happenings. Joy depends upon knowing my Savior. And you, know, you got to know him and trust in him. Folks, we're going to sing, my faith looks up to thee. My faith looks up to you. I want you all looking up. I want you to be ready. I want you standing for truth. I want you to be.